So this is audience participation. What makes a good pollinator? Wings. Wings are very handy. Okay. Yes. Yes. So some, like honeybees, have uh, is it something like that. They have a pollen basket on their rear legs that they actually gather pollen into intentionally. And so you've seen those swollen back legs of pollen pouches on honeybees. So that's a big help. Anybody else? What makes a good pollinator? What characteristics make a good pollinator? Sense of smell. Smell is important. Or good vision, right? Right. So the flower would have to be showy and fragrant. And mouth anything parts. else? Mouth parts. <coughs> Modified mouth parts to get the nectar that the plants have. And it can be a bug in general. Usually bugs, at least for chinkapin, it's bugs. I mean, sometimes birds and bats and other things. And there's legs that get sticky, have sticky stuff? Sure. Anybody else? I can't when remember the female flowers. by the female flowers. What's that? Uh, if you're asking about uh, which plant, which characteristics would make a good pollinator, if it releases, I would say, the nectar all day. Some plants, like buckwheat, shut off about noon, release right. their nectar. So. Right. And I actually also did a night study of pollinators and collected night flying insects off the plants. And so they're still fragrant in the nighttime. Not as much, of course, during the day, but it's a completely different assemblage of insects on the tree at night. So I said close association with both male and female catkins. Like I said, if they don't touch the females, they're not pollinating. Um, methodically visits each flower. That would increase the greater seed set. So if they just went to one flower and flew off, you'd only get one nut. But if they went to each one, then you get a whole bunch. Moves from tree to tree, right? So if they just land on one chinkapin all day and eat pollen all day long, well, they're not going to, you know, those trees are self-sterile, so they can't produce seeds like that. Covers a great distance. The further away you can get pollen from, more genetic diversity, the better crosses. And of course, carries pollen like the honeybees. It's a great pollen. So I divided the insects up into several groups, and you'll see some of these pictures here. I'll try to get out of the way. Um, these are goldenrod soldier beetles. And as you can see, he's chewing right there at the tips of the male flowers, which is where the pollen comes. That's all they do all day long, is eat pollen and mate. And usually, they don't move from tree to tree. Um, they'll just sit there and uh, those trees have enough pollen that they can get fat and happy on one tree they don't have to leave. Then there are nectar feeders. So if you look really closely right there, the fly has its mouth part down at the base of the male flowers. Whereas that other beetle was just at the tips of the flowers. The tips of the flowers are way past the top of her head. She's down in there actually feeding on the nectar from the flowers. Also, any of the lips, the butterflies and moths, that's also what they're feeding on because that's how their mouth parts are modified. They can only, um, they have sucking mouth parts so they just stick their proboscis down at the base of the flowers and draw from the nectar. And then, the great things that we saw there are also all kinds of bees on the trees. And you all know that bees make great pollinators. That's what's in the news all the time. There are honeybees everywhere. I didn't get any good pictures of honeybees. Um, but that's a bumblebee right there. And if you look closely, there's a pollen pouch completely full of chicken pollens. And those bees do, they go from tree to tree, flower to flower. They collect that pollen, take it back to their hive to feed their larvae, and then they come back and get more. So that's a good potential right there. There's another bee. Got a great picture of its rear end. And then there are non-pollinators. You mentioned wings, right? Ants can't go from tree to tree. They have to crawl all the way up into a tree to a flower, all the way back down go who knows how far away to get to the next tree and crawl all the way back up. I think it would take days for them to make a journey like that. So these are non pollinators And then there are predatory insects. All this noise and activity draws in insect predators. 
And these are assassin bugs. They're also mating on the tree, but they would stop and eat other things that were drawn on the tree. So finally, this is the only one I got pictures of. I saw more than this. But this is what I was looking for. So here's a little longhorn beetle. That's the female cat right there. He turns around, starts walking down, he touches the female flowers right there, and then he walks down to a male flower. So that is what I was searching for the entire time I was out there. This beetle did touch male and female flowers, and then it flew off. So, you know, in a perfect world, he went and flew to another tree and landed that way again and produced seeds. Now, there's a lot of speculation there. I can't say for sure that any of that was pollination, but it's at least a start. Um, and the problem with the female flowers is they do not attract the insects. There's nothing on the female flower that an insect would want. So, as a pollinator, so they fly on there. If anything, it's just a place for them to land as they walk to the male flowers, because the male flowers have the pollen and the nectar. And, however, the female flowers are usually at the tip of the branch, and they make a great perch. They're not all fuzzy like those uh, male catkins. So I'm going to have to read a whole bunch more papers and see what I can make out of their behavior. Um, cool thing about the honeybees, have you guys watched honeybees up close? They do a behavior called packing pollen, where they scurry over a plant real fast and their whole body gets covered in pollen. And then they fly off and they brush themselves with combs that are actually built into their legs. And then they pack all that pollen into, uh, into those pouches on their back legs. And honeybees were doing that all over the place on here. I didn't have the camera ready at the right time, but that's a plus, you know, everybody's concerned about honeybees right now, pollinators, so this is a happening field right now. And, uh, oh, I did see a honeybee also land on a female flower and crawl down, so. That's what we know for right now. I would say in a perfect world, I could get a whole bunch of people out there and sit and watch them the whole month it was flowering, and we get some really good data. I just don't have time to do that in a master's degree. So in my research, um, I looked around, uh, I had taken a plant class at Missouri State. Um, I know that there are press plant collections, reading a bunch of papers. Um, it's a good idea to press your plants and preserve them so that, uh, you know, people can look at them a long time from now and they can say, hey, here's a historic place where chinkapins grew. You can go back there today and see if they're still growing. So it's, it's a voucher specimen for the research. So I went into the University of Arkansas's plant collection, and to my surprise, they had a whole bunch that were from one of Shane's professors um, that he used in his master's degree. And so if you zoom in on the ID tag, you'll see this chinkapin was collected in 1929, Castanio's Arkansas in Benton County, Arkansas. You see that right there? Very common. So 1929, when this person, this lady, collected this, uh, it was a great time for chicken. So that's another thing you can glean from museum specimens. So I took some cuttings of some chicken and I pressed them at the Roaring River Nature Center, and they're still waiting for me there to go and finish them up and get them mounted. And I'm going to donate uh, one to University of Arkansas, and one to Missouri State and then probably one to the Roaring River Nature Center, so they have more on file. So the end goal of all of this is if insects are shown to increase seed set, you know, over in Europe, they already know that the European chestnut is helped by insect pollinators. And like with the genetic studies that are going on, we're maybe finding that the Ozark chinkman is more closely related to the European species. So that kind of backs up research uh, to look at insect pollinators. They actually put honeybees in their uh, orchards uh, during flowering to increase seed scent. So we can do that and we get better crosses if we put a beehive out at the test plot. And then uh, I don't know there'd be much food there afterwards. You'd have to move them when they were done flowering. But, uh, so we get an increase
increase in diversity of cross pollination and increase our viable seed set. There's me, Shane, and Steve down at the, what we're calling the miracle tree. It's a, it's a young tree at our field site. Um, it's about four or five inches now in diameter. Um, from what we can tell, it is not a root collar sprout, which means it took seed naturally post blight. It's only about five years old. And it doesn't have any visible blight on it, and it produces the largest chicken bones I've ever seen. And so we're very excited to see what that tree will do. I actually used it this year in my research. So uh, maybe some of you will be getting seeds from that tree in the middle this fall. So first, I'd like to thank you guys, the Ozark Chicken Bone Foundation. Uh, I would have never gotten into this if Steve hadn't backed into my car. <laughs> but, uh, the only accident I've ever had. <laughs> He just stayed vehicle. <laughs> and it was on my first day on the job with Tim and Shane. Tim asked me if I'd mention I said, yeah, I just ran into him. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank those guys. And then, of course, the university, um, my advisor, Dr. Dowling. And I had two assistants, one each year, that were a great help out there. So with that, I'll take your questions. Did you see any evidence of hummingbirds checking out the nectar or eating the insects? I had one hummingbird flying up while I was in the tree one day. But it just flew, looked at me, and flew off. So. What are you wearing the red shirt? Yeah. No, I was wearing, I was wearing green like the tree, so I blend in. Yes. Um, I, I believe that um, people that are getting their master naturalists have to do like projects. And like, would it, be, it might be really cool during the, to get a bunch of them to sit and Sure. That's a good idea. Have to be next year, though. Yeah. Next May and June. That'd be great. So, yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any way you could put some kind of trap on the female flowers so that you don't have to sit there and watch them and catch what lands on it. Is there some, a great idea. Like a, some kind of sticky trap or something you could put on I'm there? I'm sure you could modify a sticky you know. trap to put on there. Yeah. Or a motion sensor camera. Or a camera. The branches are fairly fragile out there at the tips, though, because it's this year's growth and being very lightweight. So, yeah, that's a great idea. Because we actually had the same question with, with the American chestnut, you know, there's an argument back and forth, oh. you know, wind pollinated or insect pollinated. The problem with the master's degree is you only get two field seasons. Yeah. And, you know, you just start to get a handle on things and then you're done. It's like, well, I have so many more questions now. Yeah. Yeah. I have a better idea. Well, thinking your idea about putting a beehive out there is a good one because, you know, in all sorts of fruit crops, uh, one problem we have now is that there are not enough bees to go around, and there are people, who, commercial uh, beekeepers, who do nothing but go with the uh, yep. spring and pollinate uh, uh, tree fruit crops. So, and if, if they're not there, they're losing 50% of their fruit set. And there are some fairly large commercial beekeepers in Arkansas. They, you know, they'll drive out to California for the pecans. They'll drive right. out so, to New York. And one so. thing I did notice that beetles seem to have it backwards. He crawled over the female and then up to the male, which wouldn't do any well, good until we went to the next. I was hoping he had come from another tree. Yeah. Well, like I said, with these behavioral studies, like, I can't really, in a scientific paper, I can't say that pollination happened. You know. I can only say it yeah. is possible that it you could certainly occur. imagine it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you can do studies. I could have swabbed him for pollen. I could have taken that pollen and tested it to see if it was uh, was our chink of it. Yeah, if you were more devious, you could have reversed the video. <laughs> I could have put the pictures on the back. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. But I don't want to lie to you guys. I like you guys. There's going to be some pollination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. One just step, though. You made reference a while ago about them aborting some of the burrs. Yeah. Is that in response to drought or some other stress you think where the trees do that? Really, it could be anything. I would think it would happen more in drought years. Um, they can be perfectly healthy trees. It could have a perfectly healthy one right next to it. And just for some reason, one bird drops off and is dead. And so I don't really know. Um, I see it all the time. And, but. Like they say, we still get a pretty reliable that kind of thing. It's just when that was one of your bags. You know, there goes your data. You wish you would have backed the one next to it. Any other questions? Oh, I've got a um, I'm cool. No. <laughs> oh. 
I do have a question. Uh, let's see, uh, at night, I know you're still gathering a lot of information on this, but at night, um, a lot of people take for granted, you know, when these fly during the day, you've got like a whole night shift of moths and night flying insects. So, or, and I know you called me once when you were taking photos. Did you, what you find, anything conclusive? Not pollinators on the flowers? I'd say that it's probably very important. I can't say much more than that. Um, it was mostly moths at night, small yeah. moths. And, uh, you know, pretty nondescript little brown moths. So that's going to take a while if I want to actually ID on those that I collect. But, I mean, there was as many of them on the tree as there were almost day flying insects. So I can't say that they're not important. Oh, I was going to give you my major hypothesis for the end of the season. I'll find out this year, but if nothing else, there are ways that the insects do help, even if they never visit the feed for flowers. And that is, they knock off pollen off of the mount catkins. And it falls, gets caught by the wind, and gets blown around. So, if nothing else, they are important. So, they may not be directly pollinated, uh, but certainly my friend. Yeah. Please check out my specimens over there that I brought.